How y'all doing this morning? Good. Gotta love technical difficulties. Let us pray this morning. Lord, we come to you right now, God, just praying you just uh, be with our hearts this morning to receive the worship and the message this morning, God. Just We just thank you for um, being able to honor all our soldiers on Memorial Day, God. Pray you just touch his service. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all stand and worship with us this morning. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we come to lead us in baptism this morning. Father, thank you for the opportunity we, be, we have to be here. 
And Lord, I thank you most of all, Lord, that the waters of baptism are stirred again. And Lord, uh, salvation has come to this house again this week. And Lord, I just pray that your will be done. I pray everything we say and do, I pray just glorify the name of Jesus. Lord, we love you and praise you for everything you do for us. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. We have four coming this morning for Believer's Baptism. This is Allie Evans. Allie, because you repented of your sins, placed your faith in Christ Jesus and surrendered to him as Lord of your life, I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Braxton Evans. Braxton, because you repented of your sins, placed your faith in Christ Jesus and surrendered to him as Lord of your life. I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. son stone i got four boys uh last sunday he, get, he gave his life to christ and at the same time my, one of my other sons gave his life to christ in the other building it just kind of cool that uh the holy spirit was working that way uh stone because you accept the lord jesus christ as your lord and savior i now baptize you in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit my eight-year-old Skip, at the same time that Stone gave his life to Christ, he gave his life to Christ last Sunday. Yes. Skip, because you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This weekend be Memorial Day. Tomorrow, of course, we celebrate Memorial Day, but today as a church, we celebrate today. And um, I thought about these kids that are over here and they have baptism and they're making the noise and whatnot. And I thought about just the freedom to where we just have freedom here. And I'm thinking how that became possible. And the freedom that we have to worship and the freedom we have for our kids to be kids and enjoy worship and make a bunch of noise and um, you know, that, that, that comes 
Two, I think the biggest way, of course, we all would say that that comes from a gift from God. But also, there, the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And I think there's freedom there. But I also realize that long before we ever were born or got here, there were some men and some women who fought battles we'll never know. And there were people who gave their life. As a lot of them have fought, when, when they signed up dotted line, uh, they knew that their name, number could be called. I know that. But maybe they did or maybe they didn't. And so we don't want you to look at, okay, people who have fallen are any less or any more than somebody who fought or didn't fight but just were a part of it. But today we memorialize those that, that had given their, the ultimate sacrifice. And um, I had a man tell me in this church one time, he said, Chris, I have a, it's really hard for me when we have Memorial Day for me to stand as a veteran because I feel like we're being celebrated when we ought to be memorializing the ones who have fallen. And I understood what he was saying, but it made me think also, we also need to be thankful for the men and the ladies who serve, who have served, who are serving. Uh, some of those that are actually getting out of high school that are going into the service right now, that's, that's actually right around the corner. So here's what I want to do. With, without, uh, I mean, with the, with the spirit of memorializing what Memorial Day is all about, uh, I do want to do this. I just want to say thank you, and I want the church to know who you are. But I want to say thank you to our men and our ladies who have been in the armed forces, who either saw the front lines or you trained for those front lines or whatever the case, would you just do us a favor by standing? We just want to say thank you uh, for the sacrifice already you've given. Many more have gone before you. Would you stand right now? And church, would you help me to recognize these men and these ladies? Would you join me in a word of prayer, please? Father, I just want to tell you how much I love the fact that I get to be here. Lord, I believe with all the, all the bad and with all the craziness that the United States is still the greatest country on the face of the earth. Lord, I'm thankful that I'm here. No matter what, be go what might be going on now and the direction, I know that this, this country was founded on the principles of the Word of God. And Lord, I pray that today, Lord, we may be able to change the, the country but the people in the country, Lord, we know what will change them. That's the Spirit of God. Father, I pray that you would help us to stop for a moment and think about those men and those ladies who have, who have given the ultimate sacrifice. Lord, I, I, know, that, I know there are people that are, maybe have, that are in this room that may have family that that signifies. And maybe some of you, maybe some people here don't know what that's about. Lord, I, I ultimately pray today that we never forget those men and those ladies who paid a price that we'll never even know about so we can stand here today and have the freedom that we have, especially the freedom to worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, we love you and praise you for what you do for us. And Lord, we just don't ever want to forget all the sacrifices for our benefit. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we time, time of fellowship, I want to, Evie, I want you to come join me on the stage if you would. Uh, this is Evie Owensby. Evie and Steve have been in our church. They were here before I came. And, um, and they, uh, they weren't here when I came, and they came back. And uh, I just want to introduce you to her. You've been on vacation. You're getting a little slow. You need to come on now. <laughs> and, um, and so I just want you to know who she is. A lot of times you hear her on the phone, and you may not know her in person. Uh, most everybody does, but if you don't, if you're, if you're new here, this is Evie Owens. She lives right across the, uh, right across the bridge from us over here. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something. This lady right here and her husband and their kids all grew up here, and like we all did. And, uh, but she's been on our staff today celebrating 22 years uh, on our staff and our office. And I just want to say thank you to her. I want you to say thank you. We just have a small gift for her. But I want you to help me thank her for the 22 years served in this place. And I want to ask you if you would stand and just thank Evie Owensby for the work that she does at Pleasant Grove. Love you. Now, while you're standing, here's what I want you to do. As they play a little bit, I want you to find somebody. Welcome to the house of God. Don't go to just people you know. Find somebody you don't know. Introduce yourself. Let's fellowship together as they play. We're glad you're here this morning.
Good morning. I want to thank you for joining our online service today. Uh, if you need to know more about Pleasant Grove, theplaceofhope.com is our website. And I hope today that while you're here, God will encourage you, but He'll also challenge you with the truth of His Word. Thanks once again for joining in and being a part of our online service. Have a great day. Evident and proof that God has made a way in your life. Amen. I search the world, but it couldn't feel me. Man's empty praise, the treasures of faith, never enough. But then you came along.
purpose you give birth, you restore every heart that is broken. It's great are you, Lord. Now sing the verse. You give a
just, we're just coming to you right now just thanking you for this time we were just allowed to worship you, God. Because I know there are many out there that aren't able to, God, and we just pray that you just uh, continue to bless our lives like you have because we, we don't deserve it. Mm. And, Lord, we just pray you um, speak to Chris as he brings the word this morning. Let our hearts be open to that, God. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to... Uh, I want to introduce someone to you, or a couple guys to you at first. Uh, so, Nate, are you still in here? Nate Harris, just stand. I won't make you up on the stage. I want you to stand. You see this guy right here? He and his 4 by 800 team, 4 by 800 relay team, Hart County High School, number two in the state right here. This guy right here is a part of that team. That's awesome, man. Um, you didn't see me run yet, but one day you'll get that chance, okay? I'm awesome. Olin, come stand. I want you to come stand with me. I want them to be able to see you. Come here, Olin. Now, it's hard to believe he came from... Anyway, come here, buddy. <laughs> Olin's going into the fourth grade. Just listen to this. First time taking the GA milestones. How many of you know what the milestones are? Georgia milestones, okay? He's the only one that's ever done this here. He made a perfect score in both subjects right here. You sound like your pastor, son. That's awesome, ain't it? I made a perfect score in spaghetti, I think, eating or something like that. That's awesome, man. Mom and dad are like walking around. Yeah. Dad's like, well, I know he didn't get it from, I don't know who he got it from, right? <laughs> hey, I'm proud of you, man. That's awesome. Good job. Good job. I want you to take your Bibles, turn to the book of Philippians this morning, if you would. Philippians chapter 2. I've, uh, I've never done what I'm going to do today, and uh, that might make some of you a little nervous, but it's not that. It's, um, I'll share the story with you in the middle of this anyway. If you would, take, a, take your Bible to stand. Let's read this together. Philippians chapter 2, verse, verse 12. Scripture says, Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Father, I just pray that you would be, allow us to be clear today, and I pray that not only the speech would be clear, but the understanding would be. So, Father, I pray you'd use us today, <clears throat> and for people that may be here that need to make a decision, it would be clear what de decision they need to make, and I pray they would have liberty to do that. We love you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated, if you will, just for a second. Now, um, here's, here's what I want to, I want to make sure you know something before, um, well, let me just get into it, because I've got it all in here, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Just thinking about before salvation, God worked on you, and now God works in you, and as you know, the more you know, the Holy Spirit works through you. Here's another thing, talking about working out your own salvation and fear and trembling. You can't work it out if you've never been worked in. A lot of times people say, man, why can't I live the Christian life? Why, why am I having so much trouble doing what the Scripture says do? Well, a lot of times if, um, if there's the Spirit of God hasn't drawn you and you're trying to do it on your own and there's no Spirit of God living in your life, maybe you've gone through the motions and I'm not your judge. I'm just telling you maybe why you're having so much trouble. But I've learned something over the, the, a, lot of the, a lot of the years that I've been here. When people respond to a message at the end of the sermon, Here's what I've realized. Many times when they get here, they don't really know what decision they're making. They'll say, I want to do this, but really in their heart, there's really something else, and we kind of go back and forward. And, and I'm going to say this because, not because we're know-it-alls here, but a lot of time, bad doctrine can get people really messed up and get them confused about what it really is that God uh, tells us in his word. And so when the scripture says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It doesn't mean to work for your salvation. It means that as you are saved, you should act, talk, and walk like somebody who is saved. And here's the thing. If you can't do that, maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe there's, uh, just because you've prayed a prayer, maybe there's no solidity in your life as far as the Spirit of God drawing you. Understand this. Sometimes, if you go into my house right now where Leslie's room used to be, and we had it fixed one time, but it's come back. And that is, if you, look above the, if you look above the case opening of her door going in there, there's a crack that goes all the way up to the ceiling. I had a guy come look at that one time. He said, your problem is not in the wall. 
The problem is in the foundation. And he had to go under my house and he had to do some work in the foundation to remove that crack that was in that wall. And here's what I realize is that the reason that you're struggling and maybe the reason that you've got all these things going back and forth, you want to do good, you know to do good, but man, you, are, you just can't seem to get it right. It, could not, it may not be that there's a problem in your life as much as there's a problem in the foundation of your life. And what I realized in my life when, I, when that happened to me, uh, basically I, I had to get saved. And, and what I realized is that people come forward, sometimes they don't know exactly what the decision to make. So uh, and I'm going somewhere with this, so just hang with me. But what I've realized that after I saw this little pamphlet that I have, I realized that you could just about put everyone, 95% of those decisions in five categories. And I didn't realize that that was true. Uh, Zach, hand me that, right front of that phone right there. Hand me that little booklet right there. I left it down there, didn't mean to. I was going through, I had a counselor training session on Wednesday night. And so Monday, I was getting, every, getting everything together for it, and I was writing things down. And I just, I just don't want to just pull open something we've done for years. And I just really kind of started from the beginning and went from there. I was looking through our storage room in our office, and I thought, I wonder if we have anything. I wanted to make sure we had enough tracks and all the different things. And I came across this little book right here. And it's called Spiritual Commitment Guide. Well, there, if, you know, if, you've, if you've ever been through CWT, and I know there used to be kind of a long yellow one that said a personal commitment guide, but... This was colorful, so I'm kind of like the so ADD. I saw colors, and I went, sure, went straight to the colors, right? And um, I began to look through this, and when I opened this up, here's what I realized. Those top five, I would say, topics or decisions that most people make when they come forward, uh, I looked here, and I said, man, it's like they're reading my mind. And it's the very things that we deal with. And I, I've never preached through a, through a track before. But when I, when I got this, and I began to put that thing together for Wednesday night, I thought, Man, this is too good not to share, because here's what I realize in this church and any other church, and that is this. There's a lot of people that need to make decisions, but they really don't know exactly what decision is they need to make. And so I hope that I, hope that I, I answer some questions. I hope I'm clear. I'm not going to drag it out, but I want you to listen, because I'm going to make sure that you know probably in one of these five, if there's something going on in your life, it might be that you think, you know, that's exactly what I need to do. And here's my challenge. In fact, let me ask you, instead of me giving you the challenge, let me ask you. How many of you would raise your hand and say, when God wants me to do something, I want to do it God's way and be obedient to God. And when I, listen, when I hear God's word say this, I just want to obey God's word. How many would raise your hand and say, I honestly want to do that? Okay, so I'm, I, God sees your hand. So I'm, I'm challenging you. If you don't need to make a decision, don't make it. But if there's something that comes up and say, that's exactly what I've been dealing with. That's why I'm sharing this. I believe somebody here, there's something going on. And so uh, there's probably several reasons that we don't respond or make decisions. Here's one of them, fear. I think it's probably the big. Here's the second one, pride. We know, we're good, we know what we need to do, but man, I ain't moving, pride. Here's the third one, people. What are people gonna say? Here's one that, that's probably, maybe, it, it, this may be a biggie for some of the things you see online and everything, unreal expectations. What are they gonna do to me if they get me down there? Are they gonna put me in a room and they're gonna put a bright light in my face? They're gonna interrogate me? No, I'm, so I wanna deal with five things and like I said, I wish I was so original that I wrote the book, but I didn't. But this is worth, worth your time right here, okay? So here's the first one. People are responding. Here's one of the decisions they need to make, and a lot of them that are making. And that is, I'm coming forward today because I know that I need to be saved. I know I'm coming today. I've stepped out. It's tough. It's, it's, it's boy, I, I, I'm shaking. I, 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 there's a lot of fear, but I know what the decision is I need to make, and that is I need to be saved. So people that have never invited Christ in their heart. Here's the thing. The reason that every person does not already have a relationship with God is because of sin in our lives. Sin is not following God's directions for our life. God loves us, but we are separated from God because of our sins. What scripture teaches. So let me give you some scripture that's basically, you've heard the Romans road, and this kind of involves that. But Romans 3.23 says this, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I don't care who you are. Somebody says, how long have you been a Christian? I've always been saved. Not possible. Bible says we were all born sinners. Now, here's the thing. When we first admit, when we finally admit, man, I am in trouble, I need some things to change, here's what you're going to first, first thing you're going to realize, and that is how patient and how much grace has God actually had for me all this time, that I'm still breathing, that I'm still here. When you get to that point, when you finally respond, say, Lord, I give up. Well, here's the thing. Romans 3, 23, 23 says that. Look at 2 Peter 3, 9, or it's on the screen 
The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but, is, but it's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Somebody says, I wonder when the Lord's going to come back. Let me tell you why he hadn't come back already. Because there's some people that he knows that need Christ. There are some people that says, listen, if you would just give up. And the grace and the mercy of God, it's not that he doesn't know, but I'm telling you, the span looks kind of delayed for us because there's still some people that may be thinking one thing, and there's some, still some people that said, God said, you know what? They need to do business with me. Here's another one, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Can I tell you something? Jesus didn't know any sin. He was a human just like we were. He was God in the flesh, but he was also in the human body according to, uh, 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 according to John. But here's what I want you to understand. There's a lot of times that we're sitting here and we're thinking, man, I wonder how Jesus did it. Well, he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. He sacrificed his perfect life for our sinful life that he may have eternal life. Well, here's a part that a lot of people don't like to go this way but you'd understand this, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin are death. The gift of God is eternal life. I walked into a, a doctor's office one day, and the man had some magazines there, and the front of them said Watchtower. You probably know what it meant. And in that, when they took a scripture, this particular scripture that I saw, and in that scripture, it left out the wages of sin or death. And all it shared was the gift of God is eternal life. Well, that's true, but half truths are no truths. And so you need to understand that the wages of sin are death. There is a place called hell. Scripture teaches us. There is a, there's a place called hell for those that don't follow Christ, those that don't accept his son. Scripture tells us forever and ever where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. So here's what the scripture says, though. He gives us a clear invitation to know Jesus. Here's what it says in Romans 10. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, that he has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Somebody said, what in the world have I got to do to go to heaven? It's real simple. You just got to believe that Jesus Christ is the only way, and believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Confession means I could get in front of everybody and, and say something? No. Confession means, in fact, the New Testament way of confession is what you just saw four times up in the baptistry right there. Somebody says, well, why do, we, why do we have to share? Confession is this. I, I shared it with one lady one time, and she's here today, and I said, you need to go public with Jesus. She went, oh, Lord, I, I, oh, my goodness, no. She thought I was going to make her. I said, well, you have to sing, you have to quote a scripture, and that's all you got to do. And this, the phone got real quiet you know, on the other side. And I said, no, I'm just kidding. Confession means this. Hey, I'm not ashamed. Scripture says in Romans 10, 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes in me shall not be ashamed. And so when I come to Christ, it's like this. I'm not ashamed. I'm, I want somebody to know what God's done in my life. So if someone's coming for salvation, here's what you need to ask. Here's the, the question you need to ask yourself before you come. Am I willing to walk down there? Not that you have to come here. But I'm going to tell you something about making a public step. It's an accountability step. There's something about it, but here's what you need to ask yourself. Am I willing at this point in time in life, is God literally drawing me, and if he is, do I need to just say, you know, Lord, I give? It ain't about the words you pray in the prayer. It's not about what you plan to do. It's like, Lord, I surrender. I promise you. The main thing that Christ wants out of your life and out of my life is for us, when we come to him and say, Lord, I give up. I surrender. I know I can't do it by myself. I give up. And just remember this. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone's in Christ, behold, it's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Here's a second decision that people make. And I will tell you, this is a big, big, big decision and a confusing decision if you don't know exactly what you're making. The second one is this. Hey, I came tonight. I came today because I need to rededicate my life. Okay? I want to, I want to make sure that I go through this very clearly so you can see. For many people, the issue is a sin or a group of sins that get swept under the rug and before long has stolen the joy of salvation or the love of sin is greater than the love of God. You really believe that you're a child of God, but the problem is you don't obey God. So you come, you think, man, I've got to do something. John wrote this letter to put believers back on track. Have you ever, as a believer, ever gotten off track? 
Yeah, surely. Uh, it doesn't mean that you've got to come and rededicate all the time. In fact, Paul said, I died lady, which means every day of my life, I ought to come and say, Lord, I did this today. I blew this today. And so rededicating your life, it, all mean, it doesn't mean you get saved again, but it may be the fact saying, Lord, I, man, I tell you, I blew it today. I made a mess of things today. Now, many will ask, if Jesus died for my past, present, and future sin, then why do I need to confess since he already died for them all? Well, I thought, that's a good question right there. But then I got to reading, and then I realized this. Agreeing with, number one, agreeing with God that our sin truly is sin, and we're willing to turn from it. Secondly, ensuring that we don't conceal our sins from him and consequently from ourselves. And then thirdly, recognizing our tendency to sin and relying on his power to overcome it. He said, Chris, what's that all about? Here's the thing. You need to keep a clear communication between you and the Lord. Somebody said, I want God to be fresh in my life. It's only possible when you don't have any things in the closet. You ain't got the door back here cut. Hey, God, you can have 90%, but not 100%. God wants your life. You know, somebody said, what would it cost me to follow God? Well, the price is free, but it'll cost you everything. Totally saying, Lord, I give up. I totally give up. Now, you know, there's some people that may not have committed a great sin. You may not have cheated on your wife. You may not, you may not have ever taken drugs or alcohol or whatever the case may be. You say, well, why would I need to rededicate my life? Here's some things that happens in my life a lot of times. Sometimes life gets in the way. Have you ever been there? Things are just, things are going along and life seems to happen. And you know what? I don't know about you, but you kind of take an exit off the word. Man, where is God at? What in the world's going on in my life? Rededication is not coming to get saved again. It is literally saying, Lord, I have gotten off track. Here's the second thing, involvement. Maybe you've got yourself involved in so many different things, or you've allowed your kids to be involved in so many different things. And guess what's going to happen? For long, you can't be really good with all of them. So guess what? The joy begins to do this. It begins to take a dive. Here's the third thing. Sometimes priorities. If you're like me, sometimes priorities are a big thing. I say, I'm going to do this. But I'm spending night time with God in the morning, and I'm sitting up, and I'm thinking, God, I'm going to do this. That may not make it till 12 o'clock. I say I'm going to do it, but I don't do it. Priorities get in the way. So what do I do? Here's what you do. In order to say, how do I reconfess my, not, not get saved again, but how do I recommit my life, Lord? Here it is. Start by confessing what you know is wrong in your life. Nobody may know that but you. Start by confessing what's wrong. Secondly, start by doing what's right. Thirdly, do what you know the Bible says. And fourthly, do what you know works. There's a lot of time in our life we're thinking, I don't even know where to start. I tell you what, stop just for a minute, rewind the tape and say, Lord, first of all, what does the word say? That trumps everything. What does God's word say? Whether I feel bad about it or not, God's word trumps everything. But Lord, I need to kind of start over. Not, not get saved again, but I need to kind of start over and say, Lord, what I know is true, let me start there. Now, you need to also do this. Why are you coming today? Some people will come forward. I'll give the invitation, or I might say a prayer, and I said, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to come, step out and talk to one of our, our, our counselors here. They'll come, and here's what they'll say. I said, did you invite Christ in your heart today? That was the decision they made in their seat. By the time they got here, I said, did you invite Christ in your life today? And here's what they say. No, I've already been saved, but I'm coming to rededicate. Okay? Somebody says, oh, okay, fine. And if we're just, we just fill out the card, here's what's going to happen. If they've never truly been saved, they're going to rededicate, and then six months later, they're going to do it again and again and again. Can I tell you why? Because they've never settled the fact that I know that I know that I'm saved and on my way to heaven. Okay? So I'm not here trying to, make, trying to confuse anybody because here's the thing. What I want you to do is I want you to know Christ. I want you to live that victorious life, and it only can happen if Christ is center of your life and that you know he's center of your life. So when you came, when did you, here's a question that maybe somebody would ask you, or I would ask you right now. If you're coming to rededicate, here's some questions I would ask you to think about right where you are. When did you invite Christ in your heart? Well, Chris, I, I've, I've always had him in my heart. Or I prayed that one lady told me this week, I've prayed that prayer every time you pray it. Every time you pray it, I pray that prayer. And she said, and I know at least one time. <laughs> I said, so basically in your return to you're rolling the dice. I wasn't being smart. I was just trying to help her through that. Here's the second thing you might want to do. If you've already surrendered your life to the Lord and you know it, you know there's been a time, you can go back to that time, you said, I know here's when I got saved. There's no doubt in my mind that's when I got saved. Then maybe today you are rededicating your life. 
But if you just prayed a prayer and you repeated some words, or maybe the family got joined the church and you came down with the family when you were a young age, can I promise you something? There may have been five people that came forward to join the church, and there may have been some of those that said, God drew us, and we've been saved before. But sometimes the kids get drunk along with the family, and they grow up older in life, and they say, you know what? I joined the church when I was 10 with my family, and there's never been a time when the Spirit of God's drawn them. And guess what? They're as lost as a goose in high weed sometimes. Now, my, my, my thing is to make sure, because you're going to get on your own someday, you need to make sure that your kids, you need to make sure that your kids know Christ, the Spirit of God has drawn them to himself, they know Christ, and listen, they didn't just come join the church with you, but there's been a time in their life when they have settled the score with the Lord Jesus in their heart. Now, I love this one. I went to youth camp when I was 14. We all got saved, and we all got baptized in the lake. I thought to myself, that'd make a good country song right now. It really would. Only problem is, if the Spirit of God didn't draw you with everybody else, then you just got wet, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just telling you this. So let me, let me give you just something that, that, that I share with everybody. In fact, I shared this with Stone last week. You're standing right here. And I said, so, first of all, tell me when you got saved. Whether I don't, I'm not saying, was it 89 or 90, or is it 31st or the first? I, I can't remember. When did you get saved? Tell me where were you at. Tell me what happened. That's your first decision. Your second one is today is May the what? 29th, 29th, right? And then I want you to draw a dash between the two dates. And here's what I asked him standing right here. He came forward, and he made the same. And I'm not telling him anything I already told him. I'm not telling you anything I hadn't already told him. He came forward. He said, oh, I've already been saved. But last night, this was on the Friday, Sunday, he said, last night, that Saturday night, he said, well, God did a work in my heart. So I asked this question. You got your date that you were saying you were saved, and you got the date of today, and there's a dash in between it. So I got a question for you. If you're coming for rededication, here's the question I would ask you. If you would have died in that dash before today, based on the decision you say you made here, would you have gone to heaven or to hell? As soon as I said that, Stone said, oh, I know I wouldn't go to heaven. I'd go to hell. I said, so you're telling me that on Sunday nights when you got saved? He said, that's what I'm telling you. Okay, why am, I t- why am I going through all that? Because 95% of the time, I hear that decision all the time for the last 25 years in this altar right here. Like I say, man, I want you to know that you know that you know. If you do, praise God, but there's a bunch that don't. Okay, so you need to know Christ. So if you're recommitting your life, great. If you've never been saved, you need to settle the score. And here's the thing. You can't rededicate something that you don't have. And like I said, not trying to confuse people, but you can't just do things any old way. You have to do things according to God's word. Acts 4.12 says this, There is no salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. You know, um, we don't want to get hung up on terms either. Somebody said, oh, he said this, so that means that he doesn't even know. We're not talking about, we're not talking about all that. You need to know it's not about a knowledge, it's not about a head, it's about what's in your heart. Okay, here's the third thing. Here's a, another one that we have. A lot of people come for, um, you know God's been dealing with you about a call to the ministry. Somebody said, whew, okay, off of me now. I don't have to worry about this. A lot of times somebody thinks, oh, he's going to call the ministry. That means he's going to pastor a church. That's what I was always taught. But guess what? Not always true. Let me tell you what the ministry is. The ministry is sharing the good news. And listen, you're saying for the rest of my life, I devote myself to that call of God. I believe God would call anybody that's willing. I really do. Okay? And you said, well, what about the job? Sometimes it may work into a job position like I'm in. Sometimes it may not. Does it mean, does it have to? All I'm telling you is, is that when the Spirit of God calls you, uh, you need to respond. You say, well, I'm already saved. The Spirit of God calls you. Here's what my pastor told me. He said, Chris, if you can do anything else, do it. He said, I'd rather preach your funeral than for you to say that God called you into ministry and six months later you get out and quit. Now listen to me. I've said this before and I'll say it again for this, for this topic right here. There were six guys of us that all got into ministry at the same time when I, was, when I first got in. And guess what? There's only one besides myself that's still in ministry. Everybody else has done left the ministry. Why do I tell you that? It's because there's been a lot of times in any ministry, in any kind of situation, there have been times where you're thinking, man, I'd just like to just throw it all up. 
Only problem is when you commit to the Lord, when you say, Lord, I surrender to this call. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know where I'm going, but God, I surrender to that call in my life. And I tell you what, that day on August the 6th, 1989, is as real to me today as July the 31st, 1984, when I met Christ. You say, how do you know? Man, I'm telling you, the Spirit of God drew me to himself. Here's the third decision. All right, let, let, me just, let me share something about that just so you know how big that is. John Maxwell, uh, you've heard me quote him a lot, but John Maxwell was about to preach at Liberty University, 10,000 students at that time in the Coliseum. He'd been, re- been the biggest crowd he'd ever preached to, and he was like, man, I can't wait. And I'm, well, I, he worked and worked and worked. He had a sermon that was, I mean, everybody, even Jerry Fall was going to get saved. Everybody was going to get right with God, right? The day before... He went to the, there was a two-day conference. The day before, he went to the conference, and while he was, stand, while he was sitting there, the Spirit of God spoke to his heart and said, I don't want you to preach tomorrow. He's like, Lord, this is John Maxwell telling this. He said, I'm sorry, Lord, but I've got a good one. They need to hear what I've got. And um, so anyway, he sat there, and so the next morning he got up early, got his stuff together, and while he's putting everything together, make sure he's ready to preach to the biggest crowd of his life, the Spirit of God spoke to his heart and says, I don't want you to preach today. All I want you to do is give an invitation. They're already ready. John Michael said, <laughs> second strike number two, I didn't listen. He said, I got up to preach. And right before I got up to preach, the Spirit of God said it again. I don't want you to preach today. Just give the invitation. Don't preach. Just give the invitation. They're ready. John Michael said, I'd like to say that I was spiritual enough to not preach and give the invitation. But I told them to open their Bibles, and I began to preach. Fifteen minutes into it, I shut my Bible and said, shut your Bible he said, I have disobeyed God. And he began to share what God had told him, and he said no, and he gave the invitation, and 54 people responded to the call to the ministry that day. Why? Because God said, I've got a plan if you'll just follow my plan. Here's the thing. It ain't about my ministry. It ain't about Josh's ministry. It ain't about John's ministry. It ain't about none of our ministry. It's about being obedient to what the Holy Ghost says in God's Word. You can't be obedient if you're outside of God's Word. It don't work that way. So here's what you need to do sometimes. Sometimes it ain't about you. In fact, it's none of you, never about you, right? So let me ask you a question. He said, um, here's a fourth decision. How do I know that I'm a Christian? I hear that all the time. I come forward, Chris, I, I came forward this morning because I think I'm saved. In fact, I'm about 95% sure that I am. But how do you know for sure? First of all, you can answer this question. Can you know for sure? 1 John 5, 13 says this, for these things have I written unto them, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. I'm going to tell you something. Growing up like I did, I didn't realize you could know that you know that you know. And even though it's misrepresented a lot of times when somebody says you can be saved from now always, and the old term, once saved, always saved, I say, ah, it ain't true. It's biblical, even though people, people misrepresent that verse. You cannot choose to, to look at the people for the validity of, validity of Scripture. You have to look at people and say, hey, listen, they may not be living out that Scripture, but Scripture is still Scripture. How many of you believe that? Say amen. Now, there's another question you can ask yourself during that time. How do I know that I'm a Christian? There are a lot of things that lead someone to coming forward, not only if they're saved or not, but here's the thing. If I ask you, when did you get saved, you would say something like this. I accepted the forgiveness of God in the past, but I've sinned so many times since. I feel like I'm a long way from God now. And you know what? I've been there. You know what, you know what I do? I rewind the tape of my mind and realize, no, nope, I could take you to the spot. I happen to know the date, and I happen to know the day of the week and the date and all that. That's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking, where can you take the devil? Because the devil's going to tell you a lot of times, hey, you're not saved. You better have a place to stick him and say, listen, no, it was right here, buddy, right here. Because see, here you got to understand, your salvation is the only thing that the enemy can't take away from you. They may not allow you to pray in school. You may not be able to read your Bible. You may not be able to go to the house of God. But nobody can take away what God did in your life. Nobody can. And so... Um, Let me ask you another question. What happened to you on that day? Or what's happened since that day? How does sin affect you? Here's something that used to bother me, and I'll just give it to you. What goes through your mind when you're thinking about eternity? Or you talking about scared to death? 
What goes through your mind when you're thinking, the Lord may come back? Every time my daddy would preach that, I would think, oh, gosh, I hope he don't come back today. Lord, mercy. But once I got saved, it's like, man, I can't wait. I wish he would come back today. I wouldn't have to pay my house note next week. You understand that, right? What you have to understand is that how does eternity, when it crosses your mind, what do you think about that? You know, here's the great thing. I'm going to give you some encouragement. Number one, did you know that you don't hold on to God, he holds on to you? Somebody said, well, I'm just hanging on. Well, guess what? You can let go because God's already got you if you're saved. You don't have to worry about that. Here's what the Bible says in John 10, 28. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. (laughs) Somebody said, well, Chris, I just don't know enough. I understand that. Since your understanding was not grown in over the years, you may think, well, I must not have been saved at an earlier age. Could it be the fact that nobody ever sat down with God's word and opened Bible and said, here's how you walk with God? I've seen that happen in recent days. It doesn't mean that you're not saved. It just means you've never been discipled. Here's a third one. You do not have to live in fear every day. I wish somebody had told me that years ago. I lived in fear every day of my life. God, if I'm not saved, save me. And I'll be honest with you, every time I messed up, and I've messed up a lot and still do to this day, But you know what, man? When I learn what Scripture talks about, John chapter 10, is that my Father knows me and my sheep hear my voice and they follow me, and I realize I could be saved. Wow, what a difference it made. 1 John 4, 18 says this, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Philippians 1, 6, at the end of the day, you need to hear one of the most encouraging scriptures I could give you. Here it is. For some of you, listen to me. We used to have a lady in this church, and she's still a, she's a woman of God. But every time, every time she began to think about how bad she was, she'd come down and say, I am just doubt my salvation again and again and again and again. And she was the sweetest lady, and we tried to help her. We tried to encourage her. And I wish I'd be able to, I don't know if I ever shared this verse with her. It's not a hidden verse, but I just didn't know it by heart. But listen to what it says in Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing. That he who began a good work in you. How many of you know that God, if he started, he's going to finish it? He who began a good work in you is able. Look at your neighbor and say, he's able. Look at him right now and say, he's able. He who began a good work in you is able. Able. To complete it until the day of Christ. Here's what it means, guys. I don't know about you. But I can guarantee you, some of you, some of you do construction, you build, and all kind of stuff. And Larry, you ever had a change order? And you, somebody says, "I want this right here," and you start doing it. Said, "No, I ain't what I want. Tear it out." I want. Okay, well, I know that's. I know every time you tear something out, you write more numbers. I got that. I get that. All right. But here's what I realize. Wouldn't it be crazy if you had a mansion in heaven? God said, "Man." Let, your, let not your heart be troubled, for if you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not true, I would have told you so. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Could you imagine that I've got a home in heaven? The Lord Jesus saved me when I was 19 years old. And I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says I have a mansion. I don't know what it's going to look like. I've got, I, I sent my order on ahead. I want a log cabin. I want it to be like a barn dominium on the inside. I got it all figured out. But how about every time that I messed up? Hey, tear it down. He messed up again. Oh, he repented. Build it back. I'm not making a lot of the simple fact of somebody really struggling with their salvation, but what I am doing now, when I realized who Christ was, when I became your pastor, before I became your pastor, this was one of the subjects I had, to, I had to land the plane on. Could I really know that I know that I know that I can't on W know Christ and that I'm saved and on my way to heaven? Can I know that? Because if you don't know that, listen, you're walking around defeated all your life, and you don't have to be. You don't have to be. And I realized when God saved me when I was 19, man, he saved me from the... From, from going toward hell and turned my life around and gave me an about face. In fact, the word repent literally means to change your mind to make an about face. Wow. Well, here's the last thing. I, here's the last decision that people have when they come forward. And we deal with this all the time. And somebody said, well, you just probably think because we're Baptists or we want to pad our numbers. It's not that at all. 
Here's one of the first questions. Preacher, I've come. I've been saved. Do I need to get baptized again since I'm coming here? Allie, stand up, would you? Just stand up. You don't have to say anything. Just stand up. No, that's Allie. No, you sit around here. I don't want you to get started talking. We might not be here. We're, I'm just kidding. You. <laughs> this lady right here, son, I'm telling you, we were in class on a Wednesday night. And in our class on Wednesday night, we're teaching and we're in Philippians, and all of a sudden, she just stops us right in the middle. She said, I got some questions. And I was like, all righty, share them. Here's what she said. She started talking about in church, out of church, think, think she's saved, not saved. She said, I got one question. Do I just need to get saved again? Boy, we shut the book then. Our notes, I mean. It said, I tell you what, let's just stop and let's just share it with the class. And everybody in that class will tell you that the literally, here's the thing, the realness of Allie Evans changed a lot of people's life that night because you say, you know what? Thanks for being real, and we're just gonna, we're gonna lay it out there. So two weeks ago, three weeks ago, she came and she said, she's in school of the manual, and she said, uh, Chris, I'm writing a, a paper on baptism. Do you have anything that I can read? That's why I have some sermons, and I have, uh, uh, I have a theology book and all kind of stuff out there, and I just gave her my stuff. And I said, go home, and I said, there was even a manuscript of, of my book about baptism, and uh, you can, you know, we had to do the, the, the whole theology of it and all that. Gave it to her. She comes back on two Sundays ago. Was it last Sunday or two Sundays ago? Last Sunday, wasn't it? She comes forward, and she said, Chris, or she's sitting right there. And I said, did that help you any? She said, oh, yeah, we got 100 on the paper. I thought, hey, amen, got 100. Never heard that before, but anyway, we got 100. I was on the team. And, um, and then she said this. She says, but reading the paper, I'm thinking maybe, maybe I, need to get, I need to get baptized again. I said, okay, let's, let's talk about it. So we didn't talk about it then. Called her during the week. I said, let's talk about why you said that, what's going on. Ten years old, she went, made a decision. Later, she went with Zach to a church, and the guy said, hey, have you been baptized? No, we need to get that taken care of. Got baptized, and guess what? And then about a year later, she really goes to, she goes to be a, a judgment house, to be a chaperone. She said, while I'm in the judgment house at the invitation time, she said, that day, they put us in a little room and talked to us, and she said, that day, it was like, I said, I give up. I surrender. I totally, I totally give up. And she said, I said, so when, Allie, when did you get saved? She said, Chris, it was right there at that judgment house. I'm telling you where it happened. I, I know when I surrendered my life to the Lord. I said, so have you been baptized since then? She said, no. I said, well, let me tell you what scripture says. In the New Testament, Acts chapter, uh, in the book of Acts, when the New Testament church started, everything, as soon as they were baptized, or as soon as they were saved, the very next thing is they would ask something like this, where's water so they can be baptized? It was the public profession. Here's what we're saying. The first step of obedience as a believer is to follow Christ in believer's baptism. The scripture only recognizes one in this sense because of the death, burial, and resurrection. That's what the baptism represents. And so sprinkling is not, con is not considered a form of baptism. Baptism to go under, to be immersed, that is the form of baptism that the scripture recognizes. And so when I shared that with her, she said, well, I hadn't done that. And I, lo I love, because she's just real. Y'all raised a real one right here, I'm telling you. And she said, well, I hadn't done that. I said, what do you want to do? She said, let's go swimming. <laughs> so she comes to the counselor meeting on Wednesday night, and she wasn't going to be a counselor. She was just going, we're going to come share this story. And she said, we, we gave her some, a children's track, because she has a son. And we said, uh, why don't you share this with him? She said, oh, I don't feel worthy to be able to share the gospel with my son. It's just new to me. She called me about an hour later. She said, um, I just shared that little book you told me. I just read it to Braxton. And I don't know, I, I think I did it, but I think I just led my son to Jesus. I said, hallelujah. She said, so now we're going to both go swimming on Sunday. He said, let me ask you a question. Does he know enough? Let me ask you a question. At 19, did you know enough? I can't even understand the love of God now, y'all. In fact, I just see Aaron and, and J.R. back there. Just stand right there. I just want them to see who you are. I know you don't want to stand. Go ahead and stand anyway. I'm your pastor. Get, your, get up. No, I'm just kidding. You see this crowd right here? Listen to me. This couple right here, they grew up in this church. Well, let me tell you something. You put your kids in that children's ministry up there, and you got them standing across the table from your kids, 
There's kids getting, listen, those kids are getting saved at a younger age, and here's why. Number one, they sit out of your life. Number two, they come to that one of those classes right there. Not just them, but I just happen to see them back there. They come there, and those children's ministry, guess what happens? They're going to get the word of God. They're going to get the gospel. And listen, you shouldn't be so worried. As a parent, I can say one thing, and as a pastor, I'll say another one. But you understand this. It's when they share Christ, you have to let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. Mom and dad, and I'm saying this to myself because I did the same thing, be careful not to play the role of the Holy Spirit in your child's life. He said, well, Chris, he's only six or seven years old. What does he know about getting saved? Well, the Bible says, unless you come as a little child, you should not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. I will know this. I will say this is that sometimes people six or seven years old, they come, and um, they're coming because they want to get saved. And I'm going to tell you, they answer questions a whole lot more straightforward than some of the adults that come forward. I can tell you that. And so they come, and they say, I just know, what does it mean to get baptized? I just have to invite Jesus into my heart first, and then baptism comes after that. I'm thinking, mercy. And you know what? They, they, they got no hindrances. Kids just come and say, is that what I need to do? I want to do that. What's going to happen if they get 15, 16, 20 years old, and they say, well, when I was seven years old, I made that decision, but uh, I don't know if I knew enough. Um, I'm probably not saved. Anybody ever heard of uh, the guy that does all of the children's He's passed away now. I can't think all of a sudden. We have all his books and all his... Oh, what, Dr. Who? Who? No, 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 like... I just lost... Dobson. Dr. Dobson. Is he? Oh. I thought he had passed. He's like 100, but I didn't know, okay? We'll say this. Dr. Dobson was saved when he was five years old. He said, well, he didn't know enough. He's learned something. Why am I telling you that? Because there may be a time when they're 20 years old and said, I didn't know what I, listen, you, it may happen. But don't play the role of the Holy Spirit when they're seven. I can tell you several in, 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 illustrations to where somebody's sitting in their seat telling mom and grandmama, I want to go front and I want to go get saved. Oh, no, you're too young. You don't understand. And it was 30 years later when that child became a lady and a mama and accepted Christ. As I'm just telling you, you have to allow God to be God and the Holy Spirit to do what he's going to do. Should you train them? Better believe it. Is it our responsibility? Sure it is. At home and at the church as well. So do I need to get baptized again? Listen, if you've never been baptized since you say, I was saved, according to Scripture, yes. If you've never, if you got saved, if you got baptized, I mean, if you got saved and baptized, but you've kind of coming back to the Lord, and you know it was back here when I got saved and was baptized, I'm not telling you need to. I'm just telling you what Scripture says. I'm not trying to make you do anything. I want to make sure you understand what Scripture tells us. Somebody, here's another one. People come forward and say, I, I want to join the church. There's three ways, letter, statement, or baptism. And somebody will say, well, what if I disobey God after that? Do I need to get saved again? No. You just need to realize 1 John 1, 9 says this. If we'll confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't know about you, I'm so thankful for that. Because that verse right there was not written to the lost. That verse right there was written to the church of Philippi. That, that, that verse was written by John. He said, hey, listen, I just want you to know what's going on. I just want you to know that. Hey, if you'll confess your sins. And then verse 10 says, if we say we don't have sin, we make him a liar and do not the truth. Wow. I don't know about you, we shouldn't just live in our sin, but there's time that every believer is susceptible to sin. I want to close with this right here. I called, uh, in fact, I called uh, one of the service guys today and I said, hey, listen, I don't want to, I don't want to um, discredit Memorial Day. I don't. So I asked the question, make sure that what I'm about to do is, is okay, but I, that's why I'm doing it separate. John, uh, Todd Hill is actually in the prayer room today. And Todd has a um, brother-in-law, we call him Shorty, and uh, he's Julie's brother, and he works with Todd. And so last week, you may have heard something about the shooting in Buckhead. If I say this right, Photo de Chow or something, that was the name of the restaurant. Real nice restaurant. He and his wife were celebrating their anniversary. They went, and Shorty and his wife had one of the kids or all the kids. And so... They hear about the shooting, and Todd was looking at his phone, and he said, hey, Julie, 
that's that restaurant where your employers take you guys to. She said, oh, really? And she said, oh, no. She said, I forget the guy's name, but Shorty's son and his wife were there. Thank you, Justin Madison. They were there. So she said, oh, my goodness, they're there. Well, it wasn't long, and, and they just that was kind of the end of it. The next day at work, Todd asked Shorty about it. And Todd, he said he began to tear up, and Todd said, he began to tell me the story. He said, what happened is they got there, and they were standing in the foyer, or they were sitting in the foyer, and there was this man in the bar that you could see through there, and he was getting up, getting down. And then he'd go outside, he'd come back in, just acting real erratic. And so he began to kind of strike up a conversation with the security guard. And it was the security guard's first day on the job. And so after they'd sat there a while, um, they said, listen, you go into the salad bar, your drinks will be at your table when you get back. And so he said, on the way back from the salad bar, they got almost to the table. And Justin said, I heard something. It sounded like somebody dropped something. He said, it sounded gunshot to me, but I thought not in a restaurant. Maybe somebody just dropped a pan or something like that. He said, and about the time they got to their seat, he heard that security guard he'd been talking to, and he said, don't do it. And with those words right there, the gunman pulled up his pistol and shot that security guard to his death right there in that restaurant. The one he'd just been talking to, first day on the job. All they knew to do was to climb up under the table. The guy shooting, he said, and that was one thing, but when the when the police showed up, he said bullets were flying everywhere. So Shorty gets a phone call. He said, hey, Dad, I don't know that we're going to make it home. He said, there's, there's shooting going on at Photo to Chow. Tell my kids I love them. I love you. Just pray for us. About that time, Todd said he told him that his phone went off and it was a text from Madison. Hey, hug my kids. I love y'all. There's a shooting. We don't know if we're going to make it home. You say, why do you tell that story? Because they were just out for a night celebrating their anniversary. I'll tell you something. Sometimes we have all these things. Sometimes we just do church because it's Sunday. But I want you to understand on that day, it came right down to the wire. It came right down to the wire. You said, Chris, you're trying to scare us. If I thought I could, yes. But if I could scare you into something somebody else talked you out of down the road. Here's what I want to ask you. If it were you and your spouse, and you walk, walk into the restaurant, just the same scenario, but it's you and your spouse. Something were to happen to you. I got a question for you. Do you know? Oh, well, I, I, think it's a, I think it was here, was it then? I'm going to tell you something. There's no rolling the dice in your attorney that day. That's why you hear me say all the time, you better know that you know that you know that you know that you can't OW you know. Quit trying to worry about pleasing everybody that's here and realize you've got one person to please, and that's the Lord Jesus himself. And I'm going to tell you something. We're all going to stand before God one day, and we're going to give an account for everything we've ever said or done, according to what Scripture says. So what does that mean? That means you need to settle the salvation issue in your life before that ever gets here because you have no idea when you walk outside the door, when you go to work, anything can happen. You say, Chris, why are you painting such a dim picture? I'm just painting a real one. Okay? And I'll be honest with you, you may think, that's just way, way too radical for me. Go ahead and call that, but I'm just saying, I would rather lay the gun, lay the, lay the barrel real straight. I want to make sure that you know. Because when it's all said and done, all that really matters is what you do with Jesus. That's really all that matters. Would you bow your head with me right now and close your eyes? Your head's bowed and your eyes closed. Out of these five different decisions that I just shared, I have a question. If you had to make a decision right now about your eternity and you've never made it, you never settled it, and you wish you washed it back, which one would it be? Do you know Christ? Do you know that you know that you can't OW know? 
Have you really been saved and today you just need to get things straightened out? You need to re- recommit your life? Maybe you're here and you say, Chris, I, I think I'm a Christian, but I don't know. Why in the world would you put off for tomorrow what God wants you to do today and just doubt? There's no sense in that. I don't know who you are. And there may not be anybody responding. I'm not going to rattle the case today. I'm not. Because if I can, if I can't, listen, I'm not the Holy Spirit. You are. I mean, the Lord is, he's dealing with you, not me. I'm not, I'm not dealing with you. I'm not trying to be him. So the question is, do you know Christ? You know him. Not have you been in church. Not, not have you done these things. Do you know Christ? Has there been a time in your life when you settle the score in your relationship with the Lord? If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, and you know, Chris, I tell you what, I know what I need to do. I'm just going to pray a prayer right now. And that prayer is, this is the prayer. And I'm going to pray out loud, ask you to pray in your, pray in your heart. Lord Jesus, would you forgive me of my sin? Would you forgive me, Lord? I realize that I can't save myself. But today, Lord Jesus, I know that I don't 100% know you and I need to settle that. Lord, I ask you to forgive me, come into my heart, and today, the best way I know how, I surrender my life to you. I surrender, Lord, I give up. Lord, I don't even know what tomorrow holds, but I know this. What scripture says is what I want to do, and I realize you're the only way to heaven. If you just prayed that prayer to invite Christ into your heart, let me tell you something. There's no greater decision you could ever make in your life. I'm going to challenge you when we begin to sing in just a minute. Some of our counselors are going to be down here, some of our staff. And they're here because they said, you know what, maybe somebody today needs to make that decision. I'm not trying to pressure you, but you don't need to make that decision. You stay in your seat. But if the Lord's dealing with you, you need to deal with him. Maybe you need a church to, to join. Maybe you need to join by letter from another church like ours, or a, you need to by statement that you know Christ, but you've never been a member of a church, or maybe you come today and say, man, I need to get saved and join the church, whatever the case may be. Whatever your need is this morning, I can tell you this, you may not know all the answers, and I don't know all the answers to give you. I just know that every question has an answer, and his name is Jesus, always. Maybe you made a decision this week, and you need to come make that public. We're going to be standing right down the front. John, Denise, and myself are standing right here. And if you, basically, you're going to come, and when you come, there's going to be some counselors down here. And man, they, I tell you what they'll do. They'll be here to receive you and be able to love on you just for the simple fact they realize what, what it was like when they were in that same spot. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that your will be done. Everything we say and do, Spirit of God, have your way. Well, hey, we're glad that you joined us today here at the Place of Hope. We hope you enjoyed the service. And if we can be of service to you and help you with any other information, don't forget to check out our website at theplaceofhope.com and you can contact our office and our staff directly from that site. We hope you have a great day. And thanks again for joining us at the Place of Hope.